Hi, welcome to our final unit, uh, final video in unit two. We're talking about polynomial inequalities. It's a very, sh hopefully it's a very short video. Okay, um, just to start, let's recall what exactly is an inequality. And those are simply that, that greater than, that less than, all of those. Those are, that's what we mean by an inequality. The other thing that we have to kind of talk about today that may be new information is a sign chart. And what exactly is a sign chart? It's simply, uh, you, it's simply a kind of a, new, a number line that we use to determine what intervals are positive or negative. So when we talk about sign charts today, that's all it is, is you're going to draw a number line, place some values on it, and test whether something is positive or negative. Okay, but we have a few steps for solving that polynomial inequality. The very first thing you want to do is get everything to one side of the inequality. You want to get your inequalities to be equal to, equal to, uh, sorry, greater than or equal, greater than or less than zero. That's what you want to set them to. Then we're going to factor. Nine times out of ten, your polynomials aren't going to be a simple quadratic. So if that's the case, you might have to group by, uh, by you might have to factor by grouping. Or you might have to use synthetic division. And remember, we did this last class where you found possible rational zeros. Then you tested those possible rational zeros using synthetic division. Once you hit a depressed polynomial, which meant you had a remainder of zero, once you hit that depressed polynomial, you started testing on the depressed polynomial until you got to a depressed polynomial that was actually quadratic. Because once you hit the quadratic, you can simply factor. Then you're going to create a sign chart and test the intervals, see if they're positive or negative. And finally, you get your answer. Okay, you solve for it, whatever that interval is, multiple intervals. If there's no interval, we'll talk about kind of our funky answers. There's also another thing you can do here. We've talked about M behavior before. You now know how to write it in correct limit notation. Um, we did predictive analysis of polynomials. If they were evens, our arms were going to go the same direction. If they were odd, our arms were going to go opposite direction. However, you can also use um, solving polynomial inequalities and our sign charts. Uh, in general, you can use this concept to kind of predict and behavior and kind of have an idea of what your graph is going to look like. We're going to just do simple quadratics today though. So I've got an example here for solving x squared minus 6x minus 30 is greater than negative 3. So let's review those steps. Get everything to one side, factor, use a sign chart, get your answer, and if you have to, talk about the end behavior. So the first thing I'm going to do is get everything to one side. I've got a negative 3 over here. That's probably the only thing I want to move. So I'm going to add 3 to both sides to move it over. And now I have x squared minus 6x minus 21 is greater than 0. So I can factor that. Two factors of 27 that will probably get me to 6 is going to be 3 and 9. Now we use that sign chart. And like I told you, it looks like a number line. So I create a number line. And why did I put two dashes? Because I've got two factors. So in order to talk about what the number, in order to put numbers down here, I have to figure out my root. I actually have to solve these. And just to recall, I'm going to go ahead and write that down. So that should look like x plus 3 is equal to 0. You know, we minus 3 minus 3, that becomes x equals negative 3. We also have x minus 9 equals 0. If I solve for x, means get x by itself, then I'm going to add 9 to both sides and x equals 9. So those are actually the values. Values I'm going to place down here. And I just wanted y'all to remember that don't drag just that three, don't drag just that nine, and don't forget to actually set it equal to zero in case there's a number, a coefficient in, for your x. So I'm going to put those on my sign chart, negative three and negative nine. Now here is the part about the sign chart where I said you're going to test whether or not something is positive or negative. In order to test those intervals, I'm going to have to pick some random number in the interval. But first, what is this interval? On this section right here, where did I come from? I came all the way from the left. And what's that number? That's technically negative infinity, right? So from negative infinity all the way to negative 3, that's one interval. From negative 3 to 9, that's another interval. And from 9 to positive infinity, that's our third and final interval for this problem. So I'm going to pick a number in each interval that I can work with. It doesn't matter what number you pick, but pick a number that works for you. So I picked negative four, zero, and 10. Zero is the best number to pick in an interval if you can. If zero is in your interval, pick it. The next best number to pick would be one. Okay, so I'm gonna take this tested number and I'm, in essence, I'm basically gonna plug it back into my factor and I don't want to know the real numbers. All I want to know is whether it's going to be negative or positive. So I'm going to model what that looks like for the very first question. So I'm looking at negative 4, and I'm going to plug that in. So that becomes negative 4 
plus 3 times negative 4 minus 9. And again, I don't care what the answer is. I just want to know whether this will be negative or positive. Well, negative 4 plus 3 should be negative, and negative 4 minus 9 should also be negative. Okay, then our next one is going to be 0 plus 3 and 0 minus 9. So this should be positive, Ooh, positive, and this should be negative. Why did I put the 9 back? I don't know. Okay, there we go. And our final one is that 10. So that's going to look like 10 plus 3 times 10 minus 9, and that's going to be positive and positive. Okay, and so that's all we're doing. You're literally taking that random number you picked inside the interval, plug it back into your factors, and all you're testing is whether it's going to end up being positive or negative. So what does that look like? On my screen, I'll have it pulled up nice and neat. And here, all we do next is figure out whether that's going to stay positive or negative. We've only got two two things to test, so that's that's pretty nice and simple. So a negative times a negative, that's going to be positive. A positive times a negative, that's going to be negative. And a positive times a positive is actually going to be positive again. So I'm going to, ooh, I probably, probably should move this down, my bad. Stop, stop, computer, stop. Okay, so that means this is positive, this is negative, and this is positive, right? Positive, negative, positive. That makes sense for a quadratic to kind of do that. But we haven't actually answered our question. So what is the question asking? The question is asking me, oh, where did my, my circle went? My circle disappeared and all that chaos just a second ago. So when we're looking for what we're, what we're trying to answer, we have to look right here. Okay, what does this tell me? This says the polynomial is greater than zero. So that means, what does greater than zero mean? I'm looking for positive values. Where was our positive information? It was right here, and it was right here in these two intervals. And that's what we wrote, from negative infinity to negative three, as well as from nine to positive infinity. And that's it. That's all we're doing when we say solve a polynomial inequality. I've got one more example for you. Okay, so again, bring everything to one side, factor it out, use a sign chart, and get your answer. I brought everything to one side. Okay, now I factored it out. I put a sign chart down. And again, my numbers aren't going to be 7 and negative 2. They're actually going to be negative 7 and positive 2. I test those values. I pick negative 8, 0, and 3. When I plug those back in to my factored form, I get... A negative and a negative. My middle interval gives me a positive and a negative. And my last interval gives me a positive and a positive. And if I multiply that back out, then I know that that's actually going to be a positive, a negative, and a positive. So again, I have to ask myself, what are we looking for? And we're looking right here, and we're looking for my polynomial less than zero. What does less than zero mean? It means negative values. So where do we have a negative value? In that very center uh, interval, which is from negative seven to two. So that was our solution set answer. It was from negative seven to two. Okay, what about the end behaviors of our polynomials, though. I mentioned it briefly, but you, I want to showcase what that looks like. So, yeah. So, of course, I said that we memorized some concept. We said that if they were even, we had the same arms. If they're odd, we had opposite arms. And you know that if they're positive, we're going to, uh, for an even, we're going to be up. If we're negative, for an even, we're going to be down. If we're positive, for an odd, we're going to start down and end up. If we are negative for an odd, we're going to start up and end down. However, what if I don't remember all that? What if you're like, Miss Jag, you and your crazy arms? Okay, technically you can use the concept of a sign chart to test that end behavior. So let's go ahead and solve one of these. I bring, over, I bring everything to one side. I went ahead and factored out that too. And then I went ahead and factored the polynomial itself. Oops, it looks like I'm running low on time, so I'm going to go ahead and see you in part two.